Standing on the platform of truth. Pioneer Health and Missions. This morning's scripture comes to us from Daniel 12, verse 1. Daniel 12, verse 1 reads, and if you don't have a bulletin, you can turn your Bible to Daniel 12, verse 1. But it reads here, I'm reading for the bulletin, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was, since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. And so today's message comes from Juan Contreras, will be giving us the message. It's called, The Nations Are Angry and the Other Angel. I enjoyed hearing this message, last part of it last night, so I look forward to hearing um, all of it today. A blessed Sabbath to every one of you. Again, it's a pleasure to be here in God's house this morning. So before we begin in our study this morning, I'm going to invite those that can to kneel with me to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to come here. For your protection, dear Father, you provided throughout the week and your provisions. Father, now we ask that you will grant us your Holy Spirit as we enter upon the reading and the hearing of your word, that uh, as we learn from you, we can apply it to our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, um, as you can read from your screen, uh, today's uh, presentation or the title is The Nations Are Angry and the Other Angel. Are the nations angry today? They sure appear to be angry. What do you say? But at the same time, while the nations are going about their activities, the angel or this other angel, which is a symbol of God's people, are also involved in their activities. And these are all foretold in Scripture. And that's what we want to take a look at this morning. So here's a few updates of what's going on. You, perhaps you don't know, but you might know. But for those that don't know, um, this is quite small here on my screen. But if you can see there. Russian Space Agency chief boasts nuclear capabilities, claims NATO would lose in 30 minutes. This is what is being rumored, or that's one opinion, right? Um, why is this taking place? Well, notice this other article. Russian, or Russia warns NATO there is a risk of catastrophic conflict. Ukraine counterattack near Kharkiv continues. And this also, of course, because Finland and another country are uh, wanting to or desiring to join NATO. A southern news clip reads the following. Kremlin calls Finland's NATO move a threat to Russia. So they obviously feel threatened by these other countries um, being members of NATO. And this other news clip reads, Iran readies for grid blackout war with the U.S. And the latest sign that Iran is ready for a military clash with the United States, even as it wants to, as it works to. So Iran itself is trying to get in the mix and threatens to want to war with the United States. And here lately, uh, the president of Turkey, he condemns or is not in favor of Finland or Sweden being admitted into NATO. So there's a lot going on in the political world. Um, 
This is a never-ending story in Palestine. Palestinians clash with troops in West Bank as settlers march to former settlement. So this is a never-ending thing there in Palestine between the Palestinians and uh, the Jews. And another one that is in the horizon is China. China is preparing for war as it's trying to invade Taiwan. So there's a lot going on in the world today. There's a lot of strife going on in the world today. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1 reads, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which stands for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble. Notice the following. Such as never was since when? Since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time, when this takes place, thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. So notice that the phrase, and at that time, is mentioned twice. Right at the beginning of the verse, and at that time shall Michael stand up. Well, this has to do with the verse prior to this one, which is Daniel 11.45, which points to the king of the north uh, setting his uh, place or government between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. We understand that to be the Turkish power. So whenever he moves his seat of government to Jerusalem, well, Michael stands up. And when Michael stands up, the following takes place. Armageddon begins shortly after. So that's just uh, some of the events that the Bible uh, predicts. Here's a statement um, found in manuscripts. Notice what this says. The armies of God take the field. We need to study, pour, we need to study the pouring out of the seventh vial, which is the seventh last plague. The powers of evil will not yield up the conflict without a struggle. But providence has a part to act in the battle of Armageddon. When the earth is lighted with the glory of the angel of Revelation 18, the religious elements, good and evil, will awake from slumber. And the armies of the living God will take the field. I believe in this statement here, there's a few things. Um, events that are being portrayed. It's not just one. Um, but notice that she mentioned, so it's mentioned here, that God has a providence to act in the battle of Armageddon. And it's also mentioned when the glory of the angel of Revelation 18, or the other angel as we have in our title. So you have these two events that are transpiring. In the book of Joel, chapter 3, verse 12, there we read, Let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Notice that uh, the heathen or the pagans must be what? Awakened. So that means that they were obviously asleep. Little nations, perhaps they're not small nations now, they're powerful. One of them is China, the other Japan, and many others. At one time, they were asleep. But slowly, they have begun to be awakened, and now they're very powerful nations, one of the most powerful nations in the world, right? So they're quite awakened. And the call from the prophet, or from God's word, is, Come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. So where will they be judged? In the valley of Jehoshaphat. Joel chapter 3 verse 9. Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. Prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. So here the utterance is prepare for peace. For war. So this has all been predicted in God's word which at one point in time I ignored because obviously I wasn't instructed in this manner. Um, but overall, I was taught that there's um, a spiritual war. It's all about a spiritual war, never a military conflict or political conflict. Um, it is true 
that we are all involved in a spiritual war. We, we can't deny that. That's a fact. But at the same time, there is a political or military essence that will take place right at the end of time. In the book of Revelation, chapter 16, verse 12, there we read, And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. So the drying of the river Euphrates here is a symbol for Turkey. Once that is dried up, it's for the preparation of the kings of the east to come. And this is not referring to Christ and his angels. This is referring to the nations of the world. They are coming for what purpose? Notice again, and he gathered them together. He gathered all of them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. Or as others have called it, the Valley of Megiddo. So it's the same thing, the Valley of Jehoshaphat. The Valley of Megiddo or Armageddon. There all the nations will be gathered. This is in Revelation. Back to Joel chapter 3, verse 2 reads, I will gather how many nations? All nations. And will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat. And I will execute judgment upon, upon them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. So again, we see this from all the prophets. The same thing is being uttered. Um, God is going to bring them into the valley of Jehoshaphat. And where is this valley? Well, this valley of Jehoshaphat is right out of the outskirts of Jerusalem. And many, many battles have been fought there. Many wars have been fought there um, in this valley. Um, Jeremiah the prophet, he states, Thus saith Jehovah of hosts, Behold, evil shall go forth, from nation to nation, and a great whirlwind shall be, shall be raised up from the coast of the earth. So this is Jeremiah's um, utterance. Isaiah, for the indignation of Jehovah is upon how many nations? All nations. And his fury upon all their armies. He hath utterly destroyed them. He hath delivered them to the slaughter. Sephaniah the prophet, he states, There wait ye upon me, saith Jehovah, until the day that I rise to the prey. For my determination is to what? Is to gather the nations that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them my indignation, even all my fierce anger. For all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. So this is something that um, it's obviously beginning to take place as we see um, the nations eager for warfare. Um, I was talking to a friend the other day, and he, he mentioned to me that during World War I, perhaps many people believed that that was the end, right? World War II, that was the end. And we might think that this is the end. Well, World War I and World War II should have never happened. It should have never happened. The only war that should have ever taken place is the one described in Scripture, which is Armageddon. But because God's people have failed to um, get ready, get ready, get ready, um, the sealing angel hasn't completed his work of sealing God's people. When the sealing angel finishes his work, then the winds will be let loose. So, back to the book of Revelation, we read, And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God. So the vultures will have plenty to eat that day. The birds will have, or the fowls of the air, will have plenty to eat that day. Who, what would they dine on or supper on? Well, those who are involved in war. 
It says, so that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of military commanders and the flesh of strong men and the flesh of horses and of those seated on them and the flesh of all as well, of free men and as well as of slaves and the small ones and great. So have a feast. And it's interesting because it's mentioned military commanders and people of war. Why? Because when Jesus is, arrives, that's what the nations are going to be acting, or, or they're going to be in the midst of war. In Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 33, And the slain of Jehovah shall be at that day from one end of the earth even unto the other end of the earth, they shall not be lamented, neither gathered, nor buried. They shall be dung upon the ground. So these are a few statements um, that pertain to the political side of the world that we see are transfolding right before our eyes. The only thing that's holding them back is that angel. Once that angel lets go of the winds, we know what is happening. It's going to happen after that. But at the same time, there's another activity taking place. We just read a little of the nations, where, where, what they are doing and where it will culminate. Well, now we will look upon the other angel, which is a symbol of God's people. What are the people of God doing at this very same time? Well... In Revelation chapter 18, verse 1, it reads, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lighted, or lightened, with his glory. What was illuminated with the glory of this angel? The earth. Not the church. Now, I might receive some of its glory, but it doesn't say the church will be lightened with the glory of this angel. Right? It says... The earth. This statement reads, The time of test is just upon us, for the loud cry of the third angel has already begun. And the revelation of the righteousness of Christ. Notice, the sin pardoning redeemer. This is the beginning of the light of the angel whose glory shall fill the whole earth. For it is a work of everyone to whom the message of warning has come, to lift up Jesus, to present um, him to the world as revealed in types, as shadow, in the symbols, as manifested in the revelations of the prophets, as unveiled in the lessons given to his disciples, and in the wonderful miracles wrought for the sons of men. Search the scriptures, for they are they that testify of him. So here we are reading that the beginning of the light of that angel whose glory shall fill the earth was a beginning in that time. And this is obviously referring to the year of 1888 when the message of righteousness by faith or the righteousness of Christ was proclaimed by both A.T. Jones and Wagner. And unfortunately, the message was rejected. Here's a concept that many ignore, and this is why it's rejected. Because the latter rain comes in a form of a message. Comes in the form of a message. And when we are quick to reject a message, we could be rejecting the Spirit of God. Because it's the Spirit of God that is found within that message. And unfortunately, the church, for the most part, rejected the 1888 message. And we must uh, learn and accept because that message is still true. If you, if you would stand through the time of trouble, you must know Christ and appropriate the gift of his righteousness, which he imputes to the repentant sinner. Do we know Christ? How many Christians profess to know Christ? Perhaps we know of Christ, which is different, right? Like I could say I know about the president, but I don't know the president. But when we know God, we know what he likes and what he dislikes. 
We know what he approves and what he disapproves. We know his will for our life when we know him, right? And we're familiar with his likings and dislikings because we, we know him. We know him. And that's the difference. We must know Christ so that we can please him. Jesus, while he was on earth, the father, after he was baptized, he looked upon his son and he said what? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Because Jesus did the will of his father. Because Jesus knew again his father. God still has a people where? In Babylon. And before the visitation of his judgments, we read some of those judgments upon the nations just a little while ago. And before the visitation of his judgments, these faithful ones must be called out that they partake not of her sins and receive not of her plagues. Revelation 18.4. Hence, the movement symbolized by the angel coming down from heaven lighting the earth with his glory and crying mightily with a strong voice, announcing the sins of Babylon. In connection with his message, the call is heard, come out of her, my people. So this angel is a symbol of God's people. It represents God's people. And what is one of their activities? The calling of God's people who are still in Babylon the Great, to abandon her or to come out of her. That is what God's people will be doing. So again, the movement is symbolized by the angel coming down from heaven. What do we need? Preparation. Because how many of us want to be a part of this movement? It is God's movement. It's depicted in the book of Revelation chapter 18. It is a, a picture of the activities of that angel which will illuminate the earth with his glory. And if we are not involved in that movement, then where are we? Where are we? Testimonies to ministers. I, here's what this says. I know that a work must be done for the people or many will not be prepared to receive the light of the angel sent down from heaven to lighten the whole earth with his glory. So there needs to be a work done for the people so that we can be prepared to receive the light of the angel when he comes down. Those who can ignore all the evidences which God has given them and change that blessing into a curse should do what? Should tremble for safety of their own souls. Their candlestick will be removed out of its place unless they repent. The Lord has been insulted. The standard of truth of the first, second, and third angel's messages has been left to trail in the dust. There's quite a bit that is, be, that is said here in this statement. Um, but the evidence in regards to a Bible teaching is, is there for us if we are sincere enough to receive it. Right? If we are honest enough to receive it. And it is a blessing. But oftentimes we think that a teaching is not a blessing. It's a curse. And we're our, we are quick to reject it. Now we need to be careful, of course, because there's many winds of doctrine blowing among God's people, right? Yes, that is a fact, and that is true. But at the same time, we must not be quick to reject that which is true. And because the first, second, and third angel's message, message has been left to trail in the dust, we have the following. Another mighty angel was commissioned to descend to the earth, to unite his voice with the third angel and give power and force to his message. 
the work of this angel comes in at the right time to join in the last great work of the third angel's message as it swells to a loud cry. So the message of the third angel is said to swell to what? To a loud cry. To a loud cry. I was shown that the testimony to the Laodiceans applies to God's people at the present time, and that was during the time that it was written, but it applies to us as well. And the reason it has not accomplished, accomplished a greater work is because of the hardness of their hearts. Because of what? The hardness of, of, of our heart. But God has given the message time to do its work. The heart must be purified from sins which have so long shut out Jesus. This fearful message will do its work. Now the Laodicean message is for what purpose? To awaken the people of God. To correct, to reprove God's people. How many of us like to be corrected or reproved? How many of your children like to be corrected or reproved? When you correct your children, oftentimes they think that they know better than you do, right? And we behave the same at times with our Heavenly Father. We question why. Why? Why do I have to follow this? We're not... Um, Simple enough to just accept it and be submissive, right? We have to question why. And even if we are given the answer, we still decide not to embrace it or not to follow it. That's how we humans are, unfortunately. When it was first presented, the statement continues, it led to close examination of heart. It led to what? Close examination of heart. We need to examine our hearts. The Bible says that the heart is what? Deceitful above what? All things. Imagine that. You think that certain men are deceitful? Well, the heart is deceitful above all things. Your heart can deceive you. And all along you're thinking you're right and you're correct. That's how we are not to... Uh, trust in ourselves or even our own understanding. You must trust in the Word of God. We must live by the Word of God. So again, it led to close examination of heart. Sins were confessed and the people of God were stirred everywhere. Nearly all believed that this message would end in the loud cry of the third angel. But as they failed to see the powerful work accomplished in a short time, many lost the effect of the message. That's another area where we um, uh, suffer from. We don't endure. We run out of patience. We are quick to give up. But the Bible says that he who endures until when? Until the end. Such one will be saved. So keep on running and faint not is what the Apostle Paul uh, states. Don't faint in well-doing is the admonishment. I saw that this message would not accomplish its work in a few short months. Notice, it is designed to arouse the people of God, or people of God, to discover to them their backslidings and to lead to zealous repentance, that they may be favored with the presence of Jesus and be fitted for the loud cry of the third angel. As this message affected the heart, it led to deep humility before God. So again, this message is designed to arouse the people of God so that they can discover their backslidings. How are we, the people of God, to discover our backslidings? How? If we're not even aware where our backslidings are. How are we not aware if we're not on a, studying on a daily basis, reading God's word, the testimonies? Otherwise, we will never know. Well, 
my pastor will tell me. Well, we are not to trust in men. That's God's word. That's his counsel, right? Because he's, he's frail just like we are, right? He's just another human being just like we are. So we can't trust in man. Angels were sent in every direction to prepare unbelieving hearts for the truth. The cause of God began to rise, and his people were acquainted with their position. If the counsel of the true witness had been fully, fully heeded, God would have wrought for his people in great power. Yet the efforts made since the message has been given have been blessed of God, and many souls have been brought from error and darkness to rejoice in the truth. So as we become active in the preaching work of the third angel, the angels will go before us to prepare the hearts for people to believe the truth. But here's a challenge. How many of us like to witness? God's people will be found witnessing. That is the work of this angel. That is the work of this angel. That is following after the pattern of the Christ who came and taught the masses. You know that there's people out there discouraged and depressed and sad. Not only because of what's taking place in our world today, but because things are probably taking place even in their own life. Maybe a, someone's dying or maybe someone just passed away or someone is under um, dead, deathbed. And how will they ever hear, the Bible says, if there is no preacher sent to them? Who's going to bring the good news of a better world to the suffering one? It's our responsibility and we must muster some courage. We need to pray about that so that we can muster courage, so that we can share this wonderful light, as the Bible call, calls it, or marvelous light, with those that don't have it. Notice, servants of God with their faces lighted up and shining with holy consecration will hasten, what does it say there? From place to place to proclaim the message to proclaim the message from heaven by thousands of voices all over the earth, the warning will be given. Miracles will be wrought, the sick will be healed, and signs and wonders will follow the believers. Satan also works with lying wonders, even bringing down fire from heaven in the sight of men. Thus, the inhabitants of the earth will be brought to take their stand. So here we read that the faces of God's servants will be lighted up as they move with holy consecration from place to place. Now, wherever it is that you're located, I'm sure you have neighbors, and if you're in the countryside, that's okay. You can come down into a small town and share, right? And, um, and give this good news um, to the people. The third angel's message must go over the land and awaken the people and call their attention to the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Another angel unites his voice with the third angel and the earth is lighted with his glory. The light increases and it shines out to how many nations? To all nations of the earth. So this is the activity of that angel that comes down. It seals God's people. That is the, the work of the third angel. The third angel arrived in history in the summer of 1844. That's when the third angel arrived in history. And the angel has not been idle. Sure, the sealing work has been, I would say, at a hold. That's because he can't seal the, uh, the servants of God because the servants of God are not ready. So we must be ready. And I tell you one thing. Those that are going to receive the seal of God, 
are going to receive the seal of God. The question is, will I be one of the sealed ones? That's the question. And as I stated before, I hope and pray that the angel with the inkhorn in his hands doesn't pass me by. And I'm not found worthy to be sealed. So, how will you respond? It's an individual call. How will you respond? Will you unite with the angel of Revelation 18? Will you unite with those who will be a part of this movement? It is to go forth regarding this movement as a light that burneth. It will be attended with great power unto its golden beams have fallen upon every tongue, every people, and every nation upon the face of the whole earth. Let me ask you, what, what you are doing to prepare for this work? You can only respond to that. Are you building for eternity? You must remember that this angel represents who? The people that have this message to give to the world. Now the question is, are you among that people? My profession is nothing, right? I could profess all I want. We know there's a secular saying, actions speak louder than words, right? And the angel is not going to place the seal of God in our foreheads or upon our foreheads based on our profession, but based on our life, based on our actions. So, in short, what do we have here? I want to share the following with you. In the 1840s, when the angels were told to hold, 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 the four winds were held in check even back during that time in the 1840s. As the angel began to seal God's servants, we know that the light of the Sabbath became, uh, became known. The sealing angel began to seal the servants of God upon their foreheads. This is back in 1848. And that message or the sealing message was told to be published back in 1848. As the movement grew, it finally organized itself in 1863. Why? Because God moves in an organized fashion. That's how God operates. We've read quite a bit on that. And God's angels work in an organized fashion. So we can expect that this angel of Revelation 18 will be an organized movement. And in 1888... Uh, God begins to reign upon his people, the latter reign, which is also in preparation to go into the time of trouble um, as well. Also, it's symbolized by the arrival of the angel of Revelation 18. So the latter reign is received by those who have received the seal of the living God. Once the sealing is complete, again, the angel has finished his work, and now the winds are let Loose. Daniel eleven forty five is fulfilled, which triggers the time of trouble depicted in Daniel chapter twelve, verse one, which will culminate with Armageddon. And when Daniel eleven forty five is fulfilled, God's people will continue to share or in their preaching activities for a short time. I don't know how much time, but when the plagues begin to fall, we know that everyone's destiny has been decided. Probation has closed forever. There's no more hope. No more need of the priesthood of Christ. No more need of you sharing the good news. Everyone has made their decision for life or death. But people will know it not, but only in the councils of the Most High this um, will be known. And finally, God rains his judgment upon the nations in the valley of Jehoshaphat. So again, 
The question of most vital importance for this time is, who is on the Lord's side? Who is on the Lord's side? Who will unite with the angel in giving the message of truth to the church? To the world. Who will receive the light that is to fill the whole earth with its glory? These are questions that you can only answer. In your knees, I would say. Because Peter was quick to answer when it was uh, in his conversation with Christ right before his execution. If I have to, I'll die with you. Isn't that what the apostle said? And what happened? He betrayed him. The heart is deceitful above all things. We can't trust in ourselves. By your grace, and only by your grace, and my connection with you on a daily basis, I plan, by your will, to be on your side. Until the end, I want to be a part of this military force. Not of the world's militaries, but of this army, the Lord's army. But we must comply with his instructions. And we must align our life. That's the challenge that most are not quick to accept. Just like the young ruler. He came to Jesus, and Jesus gave him his request. And what happened? What was the reaction of the young ruler? He was sad. Put down his head, turned around, and walked away. It was too high of a calling. He wasn't willing. Are we willing? What do you need to give up? What do you need to give up? You only know that. So I pray that I, as long with you all, we can be on the Lord's side. That's my prayer and my desire this morning for everyone and for those also that are watching. So let us kneel so that we can end with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the invitation to form part of this angel which will illuminate the earth with his glory. I pray that uh, we can cooperate with you so that we can be uh, that Christian soldier that you, will, that you desire for us to be, that we can be ambassadors of your kingdom and share this good news with others. As we see um, the things that are taking place upon the world, they are busy in doing what they feel that they need to do. Well, we got great light, and we have great instruction, and we know what we are called to do. So, Father, I pray that you will not only give us the will to do it, but actually help us to execute your will. So thank you, dear Father, and I thank you for this blessed Sabbath day. I pray you keep us and you watch over us, in Jesus' name, amen. Standing on the Platform of Truth Pioneer Health and Missions <laughs>